In Science Mom Extracts DNA from a Strawberry, we showed you how to do a simple DNA extraction. In the next video, Squishing Food for Science, we showed you how to do that same extraction with several different types of food. In this video, we're going to answer several questions about DNA and go through the worksheets. If you haven't given the experiment a try yet, please do. There is a link in the description to download your own copy of the Materials and Methods page and the two worksheets. For best learning, you want to do the worksheets before you watch this video. In the description, I've listed all of the questions that we're going to answer along with the time signature for where you can find those answers. So if you want, you can click into the description so that you can get right to the question you're interested, or you can join me to learn the answers to all of the questions. Who has more chromosomes, a human or a strawberry? Humans have 23 different chromosomes and two copies of each of those. So I have 46 chromosomes in each of my cells. A strawberry has 14 different chromosomes, but it's what we call an octoploid. That means it has eight copies of each of its chromosomes. So a strawberry cell has a grand total of 112 chromosomes and a human cell has 46. And that's just one reason why it's such a good fruit for the DNA extraction. Which fruit works the best for this experiment and why? Strawberries work much better than any other fruit I've tried. And I think there are two reasons for this. One, they've got some enzymes, some protease enzymes, I think just naturally in their fruit that help to break down the proteins in the membranes once you squish them so that the DNA comes out of the nuclear membrane more easily. And then two, I think they have the perfect balance of water to tissue because tomatoes tend to be too watery, bananas tend to be too starchy. The strawberry just has a good balance of liquid to solid in its fruit. The banana is more challenging. In my experience, I only get the banana to work about 50% of the time. Sometimes it works well and other times it doesn't. But even when it works, I don't get nearly as much DNA out of the banana as I do from the strawberry. Why does the rubbing alcohol make the DNA precipitate or come out of solution? It's because DNA is soluble in water, but not in rubbing alcohol. If you take your DNA after doing the extraction and you put it into water, it will dissolve. If you take your DNA and you put it into rubbing alcohol, it stays clumped together and will last that way very visible almost indefinitely. The other reason that you see the precipitation has to do with density. The strands of DNA are a little less dense than their surrounding liquids. They tend to flow just a little bit, and that helps them to come up into the rubbing alcohol layer like you see happen when you do the extraction. Why does the rubbing alcohol need to be cold? Well, for the strawberry, the rubbing alcohol doesn't need to be cold. I've done it with warm and cold rubbing alcohol and it works well either way. But the colder the rubbing alcohol is, the quicker the DNA will come out of solution and precipitate. Do you need to pour the rubbing alcohol down the side of the jar so it goes in very gently or can you just dump it in? You can definitely just dump it in. In fact, you can swirl the container around a little bit to help that rubbing alcohol interface more with the strawberry liquid. And when that happens, you will get a larger amount of DNA precipitation than if you pour it in slowly. Either way works with the strawberry. What would you even do with DNA anyway? There are a lot of things you can do with DNA, but most of them require some specialized laboratory equipment. So with the DNA extracted from the strawberry, you can preserve it in rubbing alcohol and keep it that way if you would like. You can put it in a plastic bag, spread it out real thin so you can see how filamentous the structure is, or you could even squish it into a ball and just see, once you squeeze out the rubbing alcohol, see how small of a ball it is. In a laboratory setting, there are a lot of things you can do with DNA. You can use it to identify individual plants or other organisms, just like fingerprints can be used to identify different people. DNA can be used to identify different organisms. You can sequence it, you can study it to see which specific genes or proteins are present in which organisms, and you could even do genetic engineering. You could take a specific part of DNA from one organism, plant or animal, and you could put it in another one to study what exactly does this specific piece of DNA do. So there are a lot of different things that you can do with DNA. Now let's take a look at our worksheets. The purpose of the first coloring activity is to help you realize that DNA is a polymer. Just like beads strung together make a necklace, strands of nucleotides put together make DNA. DNA has four different nucleotides and the pairs match together. A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G, just like blue went with green and red went with yellow on the coloring page. 
In the second part of the worksheet, hopefully you identified the things that are living from the things that are not living, because things that are alive that are made up of cells all have DNA. So the dog, the egg, the cactus, the snail, the carrot, the goldfish, and the bacteria all contain DNA, where the rock, magnet, silver coins, and phone do not. But you could argue that since bacteria are found on virtually everything, and bacteria have DNA, that then you could find DNA on a rock, coins, a magnet, or a phone. And that would be a valid argument, but a rock does not inherently have its own DNA. If you extracted DNA from a strawberry and planted it, could you grow a new strawberry? Why or why not? And the answer is no, you cannot. And that's because DNA is like the instruction manual, but without the tools and the materials necessary to follow those instructions, nothing happens. If I gave you the blueprint for a house, but didn't give you any lumber, construction materials, an architect or an engineer, you would not be able to build a house just because you had the blueprint. And it's the same with the cell. Without all of the machinery in the cell that will read the information in the DNA and then turn it into proteins, you're not going to be able to build anything. So strawberry DNA put in the ground would just decompose and you would not get any new strawberry. Second question, if you extracted DNA from a strawberry and ate it, could you become a strawberry growing mutant? Now this leads into a fascinating topic of genetic engineering because there are ways that we can take pieces of DNA from certain animals or plants and then insert them into other animals and plants, but it cannot happen by eating DNA. When you eat the DNA and it goes into your stomach and you eat strawberry DNA every time you eat a strawberry, right? Because the DNA is inside there. When it goes into your stomach, the acids will break it down somewhat, and even if there were pieces of it that got through the stomach lining and into your bloodstream and were floating around, the DNA in your body is protected by the nucleus and by proteins that, you know, it's wrapped around proteins really tightly inside that nucleus, and there are a lot of safety mechanisms to keep external DNA from going in and getting inserted into your own DNA. But if you get sick with a virus, Dun, dun, dun. That's exactly what happens to your cells. The virus is very sneaky and it lands on your cell and it inserts a little piece of DNA or RNA into your cell and that tiny little segment is sneaky enough to get inside your cells and trick them into making more viruses. So the next time you get sick with a cold, you can think about that, that little connection there. A tiny little microscopic organism, this virus, has hijacked your cells and made them into virus producing mutants. And then your immune system has to go and clean everything up and it's a big mess. If you want to learn more about that, just research a little bit more about genetic engineering, about viruses. There's some fascinating topics that relate to those two thinking questions. Time for our level two worksheet. So in this worksheet, you learn why DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid. And it's because the deoxyribose refers to the sugar that is in the backbone of DNA. It's a ribose sugar which means it's a five carbon sugar, but it's lost one of its oxygens, so we call it a deoxyribose. So that's the, that's the yellow. You want to color all your ribose sugars yellow, and you can see that they're a pentagon shape. And if you haven't seen molecules drawn like this before, let me explain real quick, because this is really cool. So many of the molecules that make up me and you are made up of a lot of carbon and hydrogen. And so chemists got tired, you know, if you're drawing out molecules and you have to keep drawing C's and H's over and over and over again for all the carbons and hydrogens, it gets pretty tedious. So they said, you know what, we're just going to draw lines with corners for the carbons and hydrogens. Anytime you see a corner, you know there's a carbon there, and then you go to another little corner, there's another carbon there, and however many hydrogens they need, they have them. And it makes drawing organic molecules a lot easier. So this little pentagon ring actually represents their five little carbons. Bing, 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 that are all around that, that sugar. The nucleic in deoxyribonucleic acid comes from nucleobases, or nitrogenous bases. And there are two versions of these. There's a two-ring version, and there's a one-ring version. And so we colored the one-ring versions, the pyrimidines, we colored those blue, and then we colored the two-ring version, the purines, we colored those purple. And then we colored the phosphate group orange. The backbone, this orange and yellow part here, really likes water, and it has a little hydrogen group on and extra oxygens that I didn't draw just for sake of simplicity here. And because of those little extra hydrogens that can come off and on the oxygen, that gives it a bit of an acidic quality, and so that's why it's called an acid. So there we have a simple little diagram of DNA with the main base pairs, adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine. And now it's time for another thinking question. 
If you open up a candy that is flavored like banana, like a banana Laffy Taffy, there is a really distinctive smell that is that artificial banana smell. Well, that artificial banana smell comes from isoamyl acetate, and it's also found in regular bananas. It's a very simple molecule and easy to produce, and so it's a very common flavoring in everything from, from coffee and soft drinks to candy. This is a compound we eat fairly frequently, whether in natural fruits or in artificial flavorings. Because it's a very easy synthesis, we made this in one of my organic chemistry labs when I was in college, and you cannot believe the smell. <laughs> the whole lab smelled really strong, like banana Laffy Taffy. It was just this really pungent odor that permeated the lab, and when I went home, my roommates, the first thing they said when I walked in the door was like, oh, how come you smell like bananas? It smells like banana Laffy Taffy. So it's a very distinctive smell. So the question is, we're gonna pretend like there is an enzyme called banana ace, which makes isoamyl acetate from isoamyl alcohol. And if you took the, the gene, if you took the piece of DNA that codes for that enzyme and you put it into a strawberry, would the strawberry produce isoamyl acetate and then taste like a banana? Why or why not? That's the question. And the answer is, it depends. The, the first qualifier is that taste is complicated. And if you produced isoamyl acetate in a strawberry, it might interact with other, other compounds that are in there, and the taste might end up being quite different from the banana, but definitely it would change the flavor of the strawberry. Whether it would change it to taste like a banana, eh, I, I'm not so sure. You could get there by just adding that one molecule. And then the second thing to consider is, is there isoamyl alcohol in the strawberry? If the enzyme doesn't have its starting molecule, its substrate, then it won't be making any isoamyl acetate. And then the third thing to consider, and this is the really important one, is where are you going to put the strawberry DNA? Because we have huge sections of our DNA that are not active. They're not turned on, they never get read by the machinery in the cell that reads the DNA and then turns the information into products. They never get seen, they're always just wrapped up really tightly. And if you put that gene into a section of DNA that's not active, then nothing will happen ever. But if you put it into a section of DNA that's active and then it gets read, then you'll get that enzyme banana ace produced in the cell. So those are a few things that hopefully came up in your answer when you were thinking about this discussion question. And hopefully you were able to do a little bit of research and learn a little bit more about DNA to RNA to protein that wonderful process of information being translated into actual products in the cell. If you have a question about this experiment or about DNA that didn't get answered in this video, be sure to leave a comment and I will reply and do my best to answer your question. If you'd like to be notified the next time we have a science experiment come out, be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and then click the little bell and you'll get a notification the next time we release a video. And if you'd like to join us on Patreon, you can find additional worksheets and bonus videos there as well. Thanks for watching.